Okay, let's get started. It's my uh, real pleasure to introduce one of our uh, star alumni from the Robotics Institute, um, Joel Pino. Joel's coming to us from McGill University now. Um, Joel is very well known for work in both machine learning and robotics, particularly on um, elements of planning under uncertainty. And I think some of the key algorithms that people think about planning under uncertainty are to Joel. Um, but following that work, she's done a lot of really cool work recently on um, applying techniques that we get excited about in robotics to things like clinical practice. And I think that's really cool. And I don't think that bears on her current stuff, but you should look up her papers. are really neat. And so I'll let you all take over. Thanks very much, Drew. It's really great to be here. It's a pleasure um, to be back. I think the last time I was in this room was for my PhD defense about 10 months ago, and I started the PhD defense by stating that I really hated robots. Um, <laughs> I'm not sure if that went over well with the committee, um, but they still let me graduate and I'm coming back 10 years later to tell you that I was completely wrong. Robots are fantastic things, especially when you have a group of really talented students to do all the heavy lifting. And you can just come and show the pretty pictures and the movies and so on. Um, under such conditions, I encourage everyone to pursue robotics. I'm here to tell you about the wheelchair work that we've been doing at um, Carnegie Mellon, but because this is a little bit of a homecoming, I thought I would show a couple pictures of the people, some of the people who were here with me, for those of you who knew me many years ago. Um, I think uh, you might recognize Erin, who is a grad student with me, uh, who's still in Montreal doing very well. And some of you may recognize on the left, Sophie, who was, I think, the first official robo-baby, um, who was 11 months when we left here, and now is 11 years old and building her own first robot. Um, and there's been new siblings to join the family. Um, three other little boys followed. So this is sort of the family picture for those of you who knew us many years ago. Um, what I'll tell you about today is more the robots that have been growing in the lab. Um, we have a few wheelchair robot platforms that we've been developing for the last six or seven years at McGill University. And the project is a multidisciplinary collaboration with researchers at École Polytechnique de Montréal, Université de Montréal, the School of Rehabilitation. And we're part of a larger network in Canada called CanWheel, which focuses on technology aimed at wheeled mobility. And so there's a lot of efforts going on in that side. If some of you are interested in assistive robotics, you may want to look up some of this. Um, in our particular group, our aim is really to develop wheelchairs that are based on commercial power wheelchair bases and to enhance them with robotics technology such that they can walk, work autonomously in dynamic environments. The platform, just for those of you who are very curious that we're using, is a commercial wheelchair on which we've added laser range finders. There's two of them at the front, one at the back. There's a Kinect sensor also that's picking up pieces of the information. And as I talk through some of the various components that we've developed, you'll see how some of these sensors are used throughout. Um, we have two-way speech interaction, so we've done some work on dialogue modeling, human-robot interaction at that level, though I won't talk about that quite as much today. Um, and all of the software that we've, I'm going to describe and we've developed is all ROS compatible and available for sharing if some of you are interested. The problem that we're really trying to solve is one of how do we do navigation on these platforms. Um, so some of you, this may seem familiar. Um, this is what the navigation looked like uh, when I left CMU and maybe when I started at McGill, we had this Carmen system that let us do the navigation. And it worked great in some cases on the right. This is the, one of the first maps we built at McGill University. You'll notice all this white empty space, beautiful empty hallways taken around midnight when all the students had gone home. The mapping worked beautifully. A robot could navigate, get to the elevators. It wasn't quite as able as Cobot and couldn't actually get on the elevators and off. But still, we thought we had a good handle on navigation. And then the students came back in the next morning and things were not so pretty. The hallways had a lot of people moving in there. There was um, a lot of obstacles, as we call them obstacles, we call dynamic obstacles moving around. We were not very good at modeling the dynamics of these people. Um, and so what our robot would do is a lot of stop and go motion. It would kind of move forward a meter, stop for people to move by and so on. And so the navigation was really not very fluid. 
Maybe this is not a problem for some robots. In the case of a robot that is a wheelchair robot where there's a person who's sitting on the wheelchair who would like to get moved through that environment, it seemed like a very, very poor navigation solution. So we launched on this program of what we call social navigation, which is getting robots that are used for social interaction to move in ways that are conducive to good social interaction, in ways that are appropriate, ways that maybe you and I would move, and that in some cases replicate the type of behaviors that we observe from expert wheelchair controllers and wheelchair users. And so what I'm going to describe today sort of two pieces of work that we've done in that realm of social navigation where we are aiming to develop navigation algorithms that are aimed at human environments and robots that are used by humans. And for those of you who have a sense a little bit of how the control architecture of a robot works and are going to try to figure out where does this fit in our whole system. We have roughly a three-layer architecture on board the robot right now where there's a low-level controller that deals with the immediate obstacle avoidance and there's a high-level controller that's doing the kind of the path planning at the level of picking some intermediate via points for our robot. And so the social navigation that I described is really plugged at that middle level where we know roughly where we're going a few meters away, but we want to figure out how to get to that sub-goal in a way that's sort of graceful and socially appropriate. <coughs> um, we're not the first to deal with the problem of social navigation. This is a video that may seem familiar for some of you. She can interact with people in real time using a combination of her voice and her facial expressions, both to clear her path and to direct people around her to the exhibits. Could you please stay behind me? <laughs> I need to get through. So that worked well in the 1990s when the robot was a novelty and you could allow little kids to climb all over your robot. Um, it wasn't going to be quite so successful on board our robot wheelchair. So we needed to figure out a better way to be doing this that wasn't quite so intimidating. Um, so we turned around, looked around a little bit in the literature, and it turns out that there was some very nice work happening in the area of imitation learning that we thought we could use. Some of that work was happening here at CMU as well as a few other places. And the basic intuition that we were trying to leverage is the fact that in most of these work, you assume that you have an expert controller that can show you trajectories of how to control your robot, and then you can use these trajectories and apply them on your agent when it's behaving autonomously in a way to mimic the type of trajectories that you've observed from the training runs. And in our case, we have the fortunate, um, in a sense, the advantage that we can take real wheelchair users, ask them to drive the robot around in a crowd. And so rather than trying to infer what is the right strategy for building that cost mark that we would need, for moving in a socially acceptable way, we can just take examples of socially acceptable trajectories from people who are experienced wheelchair drivers, use the data from these trajectories, and apply this on a robot to learn how to adapt the robot's behavior in the case of dense crowd situation. And we can collect the data under different conditions if necessary to get a very representative set of data and try then to use that on board our robot. So that was the general approach that we tackled. The approach to imitation learning <laughs> is quite simple. Maybe some of you are quite familiar with it. I know some people definitely are. The idea is that you have a training set from past trajectories that you've obtained from an expert and in your training data you've seen in a sense a set of states that are visited by your agent. Maybe you describe these sets by a feature vector so you have different features of your environment that are picked out of your sensor data and from all of your training trajectories you also have the information of what did the expert driver do during each of these situations. So you have this input-output pair that's your training data that tells you where was I, what was going on in the environment at the time, and what did the driver do. And now you have a testing data where you're actually trying to apply the imitation policy. In the middle you do a little bit of work, we'll tell you what kind of work we think you should be doing in the middle. But then with your testing data, then you're launching your robot in autonomous mode. It's going to visit a set of state and at each point it can query that learned policy that you've figured out from the training data and decide what to do in terms of applying your action at that step. 
and it's a relatively easy method to implement. Maybe the middle step of how to learn to predict the policy is a little bit underspecified here, but there's a lot of machine learning methodology that you can build on to tackle that specific step of how to learn the matching from the observed state feature to the action that you want to learn. And so there's a few technical problems from the machine learning side that you have to worry about a little bit. Compared to a standard approach to machine learning, you tend to have, in some cases, different distributions of states that you're visiting when you're collecting your training data than when you're actually running your test data. So you have to be a little bit concerned about that in terms of how much data is going to take you to learn the right policy. Um, but fortunately, there's some really good people who had looked at that problem. Drew and some of his team had thought about that problem and figured out for us a little bit what we needed to do. Um, their dagger algorithm in particular, we thought was a very, very nice solution. So that was a bit our starting point. We said, let's take dagger, see what we can do on the wheelchair, and try to run that forward um, and get some nice looking trajectories. And when we did that, I'm sure it wasn't Drew's fault or any of his team's fault, um, but it didn't quite work as advertised um, for our particular robot. <laughs> so we figured we had a little bit of work to do. Um, in some cases, it seemed like the algorithm was performing actions that were unnecessarily risky. Um, in particular, um, <laughs> because we were using a wheelchair, we were concerned about avoiding collisions and things like that. So there was some case that was difficult. And in other case, it seemed like it was requiring quite a few actions from the Oracle in parts of the state space that had already been explored well enough. So it wasn't clear that it was making the most efficient use of the training data that it could. Um, and so we, uh, we spent a little bit of time trying to figure out what we could mildly tweak in the algorithm in a way that it would allow us to use less data and avoid some of these risky situations. And it turned out to be a relatively modest change in the algorithm. It's essentially, you know, about two lines that could be um, changed. And the main insight that we used in this case is that we would still collect a data set from our Oracle, our expert driver, get the person who knows how to drive the wheelchair, to drive the wheelchair through densely crowded corridors. So we take out the robot. Usually at noon is the best time. There's like classes students are pouring out. They're trying to get to their next class, get to their lunch. And that was really a good time to collect some of the data. So get some of that data that we can collect and then learn a policy from that data set using some supervised learning technique. And then after that, rather than executing the actions from the policy in the next round to learn how to collect the next data set, what we would do is actually check under what conditions were we visiting a state that had, how, that had already been visited. So we had a particular criteria for deciding when were we visiting a new part of that state space. And by that, I don't mean like the physical state in the building where the robot was. I mean the features that we were observing from our sensor data. When were we in new situations with respect to that feature space? So maybe we hadn't seen that particular crowd density condition. And in that case, we would ask the Oracle to provide an action and we would actually execute that Oracle's action. So that was the main difference as well. When we asked for an action from the Oracle, we would execute the Oracle's policy. And otherwise, we would execute the policy that we had already inferred based on a particular criteria. The specific criteria that we were using is what we call the max mean discrepancy criteria, which one comes from work that um, Arthur Gretton did in the machine learning literature that turned out to be the right criteria for comparing the distributions of features that we had. And in this particular case, <laughs> we could actually show that you had very similar theoretical properties as Dagger in terms of the number of queries that we needed out of Oracle to learn a policy with provably good properties. Um, and we could actually avoid, in some cases, making queries. And it turns out that we avoided coming, not completely, there's still a little bit of work to be done, but we could reduce certainly the number of cases during the learning period where we would come in close contact with some of the people in the robot's environment. Um, we could look at some of the trajectories, and in this case, uh, what I'm showing is just the case where the robot is trying to get to a particular goal in black is sort of the initial trajectory that was demonstrated 
by the expert user. And in blue, we have all the iterations where the robot tries to go and replicate that trajectory again. And in red, I show the places where it's actually asking for the input from the Oracle. And the blue, the places where the robot sort of knows what it's doing and doesn't need to ask for input from the Oracle. And so in this case, we see that quickly after just a few iterations, the robot learns to wean itself off from the demonstration from the expert and can actually learn to mimic closely enough the trajectory. This specific case was done with static obstacles, you know, the three boxes, that is literally a few boxes that we put on the ground in the lab, just so that we could see really clearly what was going on. We've done this both with static obstacles, with dynamic obstacles, and in both cases, if we compare to the original dagger algorithm, I'm sure, again, just our implementation of the dagger algorithm, compared to what we could do, um, that we could achieve quite um, good performance with relatively fewer demonstrations and as well no subjects were armed in the conduct of this um, study. But what we found is that in many cases this required substantial new training as we were updating the configurations and the densities and so on. Um, so in a second part of the work, we turned away from the work on imitation learning and tried to look a little bit more closely at the literature on inverse reinforcement learning where the goal in this case wasn't so much to mimic the behavior of an expert that we observed, but really to take these same demonstration from the expert, but infer the cost function that the expert must have to be exhibiting the behavior that we were seeing. And so I haven't told you yet what type of features that we were looking at when we were doing this, um, because it wasn't so relevant for the work on imitation learning, but when it got to the, to the inverse reinforcement learning work, I'll tell you a little bit more about the type of features that we're pulling out of our sensor information. And because when we're learning the cost function, it becomes quite easy to pick out what are the features of the environment that seem to matter in terms of making certain decisions. Um, so for those of you who haven't seen inverse reinforcement learning, maybe it makes sense to start with the reinforcement learning problem, which I'm presuming most of you have indeed seen. The idea is you have an interaction with an agent in an environment, and that interaction lasts over a sequence of interactions. There's a trajectory of a certain length, and at each time step, the agent is in a state, takes an action, gets a reward function. And most of the time in the traditional framework, the goal is to take some actions in such a way as to uncover an optimal strategy for maximizing the sum of rewards over time. So you get to tr try different actions and you try to maximize that sum of rewards. And in inverse reinforcement learning, you're just switching the problem. So in that case, we're in the similar setting as we were before, where we get to ask our expert to drive the wheelchair around in the environment. And through these trajectories, we're not so much trying to decide what the expert should be doing, we're asking given that the expert picked this sequence of action, what is the cost function that the expert must have had in their world model that led them to say, take that action. And so what we're really trying to do is estimate a reward function, a cost function, I'm using the words interchangeably, a reward function that's going to explain the choice of actions that we've seen. And so we've phrased the problem in three different components. The first component is really this question of figuring out what are the features that we need to extract from our camera system to be able to do this. There had been some work previously on inverse reinforcement learning for the purpose of social navigation. You would think our job is done. Um, it turns out that a lot of that work was done in simulation with the case where they had very precise, how fortunate, precise localizations of all the people in the environment. So the robot would go out and it had very specific GPS coordinates of like all the students flowing out of their classrooms. Wonderful thing. I'm sure technology can accommodate that at some point. Our robot doesn't have that information. Our robot has a couple laser rangefinders, a connect sensor. We weren't going to get precise positioning of everyone in the environment. So we needed to work a little bit harder in terms of figuring out what are the feature information that we can extract reliably. What are the ones that we can extract in real time, process them quickly enough that we can then use them in our closed loop control system. So that was step number one. Step number two was the actual inverse reinforcement learning. So take the expert trajectory, project it into that feature vector that we've selected, step number one. From that infer what's the reward function. And step number three was to use the reward function, plug that into a planning algorithm. 
such that when it's the robot's turn to behave autonomously, it can use the cost function that it's learned and in real time plan a path through the environment. And I would say that though, you know, we thought this is what we were doing, in reality, we spent all of our time doing number one and number two and three fell into place relatively easily. And I'm still not sure we have a really great solution to number one, but let me tell you at least what we did. Um, in this case, we used uh, the Kinect sensor to pick out the information and we tried to analyze the scene, not so much in terms of tracking individual people in the environment, but really getting a sense of the higher order information of the scene in front of us. So what we did is take the space, discretize it in relatively large bins, and in each of these bins try to estimate what was the density of the people in that bin, just based on the density of the points from the RGBD camera. So in this case, we're just using the 3D point cloud. We're not using the camera information and then estimate the actual behaviors of those points in terms of the flow information. So what was the velocity, translational, rotational velocity of these points? And we would do that by looking at consecutive frames in this case to estimate the flow vectors. And out of that, we'd get this vector. We did some binarization to do one hot encoding of some of these features, but essentially that's the information we're encoding. What's the density of the crowd? In what direction is this crowd moving? And the third piece of information that we were using is um, where does the robot want to go? So remember, I have this three-layer architecture. From the top level, I'm getting some sub-goals that I want to achieve. So I'm using these sub-goals to give a general sense of a vector. Is the robot trying to go straight? Is the robot going more to the left, to the right, and so on? So if I have dense crowd over there, crowd is coming down this way, Maybe my robot is better to go around this way. That kind of information was captured in that particular feature vector. Um, so in particular, what turned out to be a little bit difficult is estimating the velocity um, of the flow. That turned out to be, um, I mean, it seemed like a standard computer vision problem that should be solved. It turns out that having reliable information of that in real time is still quite difficult. And in some of our work, it's still not clear that we're getting really good information about this. So if some of you want to volunteer to like build a better component for that, I'd be game to give it a try. In terms of inverse reinforcement learning, there's a few different models that are available in the literature for doing inverse reinforcement learning. Um, we looked specifically at the case where we had a linear reward function. So we were assuming that for the feature vector for the features that we had picked in the first step, our cost function could be expressed as a linear combination of those features. And all that was left to do in terms of inferring the cost function was to infer the parameter of that linear function. So that was relatively simple, done for convenience. And then we modeled the probability of the expert taking a particular action using a softmax soft function that uses that particular linear function as part of that. That was also quite straightforward. And if we use this particular softmax model, then we can look at the likelihood of a full trajectory, right? My agent is not taking, the, my expert driver is not taking just a single action. My expert driver is taking a full trajectory. So I can look at the likelihood of a particular trajectory under a particular model. And so now the problem of inferring the cost function gets reduced just to the problem of maximizing that likelihood function, or more specifically, finding the weights of my linear function that maximize that likelihood function. And we added a little bit of regularization in this case to try to see which features might or not come up in the function. So that step was relatively straightforward in a sense. <clears throat> and then we could take this and pl plug it into a planner just using the cost function that we had used. And what I'm showing you here, because I think it's quite interesting, is just what happens when you look at these weights, right? That's the beauty of using a linear function approximator. You can kind of look at the weights on this function and say, what are those features that matter? What are the features that don't matter? Um, a few things come into play. You know, there seems to be the right relation in terms of Density, if there's high density, that's a high cost. Low density, that's a low cost. Same in terms of the direction of the velocity. What we're seeing is that the magnitude of the velocity doesn't seem to play any role in how we're inferring our cost function. That's still a little bit of question mark there. Is it that the 
velocity magnitude, meaning like the speed at which people are traveling, is it really that the speed doesn't matter? That's one possibility. That what we need to know is how many people are there and which way are they going, and that the crowd travels at relatively uniform speed, so knowing that speed doesn't matter. That's one hypothesis. The other hypothesis is that we're estimating that speed so poorly that it turns out not to be useful for our cost function to explain the behavior of our expert. And right now we haven't teased the part which of these two things it is. So it's in that sense that if some of you have good tools for estimating that from point cloud data, I'd be keen to try it, just plug it in and see what comes out. But so far, this is what we found from the data that we are using. Um, we applied all this, of course, in lab situations. And in lab situations, we can take all sorts of very nice measures that compare how well do we do with an RRL algorithm versus with the human controller. And this is a more classical um, path planning algorithm that does sort of a shortest path planning, that does more stop and go behavior. So in some cases, you know, we see that this is getting a lot closer to the people in the environment than either the human or the IRL system are getting. Um, and the same with the avoidance. This is the average avoidance distance through the whole trajectory. And this is the closest point where it gets throughout the trajectory. We started doing that with one person. In this case, it was kind of a chicken kind of game. The robot and the person, one of them, the robot's in blue, person's in is yellow. They have to kind of switch space and end up in the other one's position without necessarily knowing whether the person or the robot's gonna go left or right. They have to kind of figure it out on their own. Then we threw in a couple other people in the mix, and again, we saw similar results where the standard systems were getting a lot closer to the person. And in some case, when there's multiple person, then the standard planners were doing a lot of stop and go to the point that it takes a lot more time for the robot to get to where it wants to go. Whereas if we were using the social navigation or the human controller, we could get to the goal quite faster and using uh, relatively safer distances. All the learning for these was done in the lab setting, so with one or two person walking around. So all of the training data we had in terms of the expert trajectories was taken in the lab for just one or two people. Then we went out into what we call the natural conditions. This was the hallway um, during the lunchtime hour, and this is from a first person video on board the wheelchair of what happens when the inverse RL tries to navigate the hallway the first time around without any additional training in the hallway. So reasonably good. None of these people were explicitly modeled. We didn't do explicit tracking of any of these people. We're just using that 12 dimensional, make that nine dimensional feature vector with a connect in real time. We didn't have to redo any training in this case. Probably we would do better if we redid training. We didn't really even have a map of the environment in this case. Um, we did for the high-level planner, but the mid-level planner wasn't using any map information in this case. It was just using the pseudo goals that it was being sent down from the high-level planner. Um, so what was quite interesting from our point of view is that you could achieve pretty fluid motion in that environment with so little information from the environment, so little information in terms of tracking people and so on. And we could measure a few things under this case too, maybe the most interesting one to look at is the percentage of human intervention ratio. So what we did is we sat someone on the wheelchair and we let them take over control whenever they felt somewhat unsafe or they felt that the autonomous controller wasn't doing the right thing. And when they were using a classical planner, they felt they had to take control about 68% of the time. And when they were using their RL planner, that was down to about 20%, 18, 20% of the time that they felt that they had to take over the control of the system. And so we felt we had a lot more reliable solution. It's not 100% there. There's still a certain number of situation where the person feels like they should take over control. Again, we didn't measure, we didn't observe any collision during this time, but certainly there were some close enough calls that the person felt they could in some cases um, get a little bit too close and they felt that they wanted to take over. It was a very, there was a very fluid shared control pro protocol. They could basically just kind of push on the joystick and that was enough to take control. So it wasn't very complicated. So they were a little bit trigger happy in some cases, which we preferred rather than 
sort of accidents. Um, but it feels like there's still some things that we can do a little bit better in this case. And it seems like most of the time where the person was taking over control were cases um, where there was significant occlusion. So we had a person coming forward towards the robot and we could figure out the velocity, of, maybe not the velocity, but at least the direction, the fact that the person was there, it's not that we hadn't seen them, but that person ends up going one way and someone that's standing right behind them ends up cutting right across in front of the wheelchair. In that case, our Kinect sensor, which is placed, it's on one of the armrests of the wheelchair, so it's about that height, wasn't necessarily picking up the person or behind, or it didn't have the right model of what the person was doing. So we've spent some time next trying to figure out how to deal with that. Yeah, Matt. Yeah, um, so what percentage of time the person in the wheelchair felt the need to intervene? And then, so it's a hundred percent because that human is the driver. So, shouldn't you do a, a control experiment where you have a human that's not the driver, that's being the expert, and then see? Because maybe people, maybe people take over just because people are. Just because people want to take over once in a while, even if the wheelchair's behavior is ideal. Mm -hmm. so, so that could well be absorbed into our 18%. We didn't give them any boundaries in terms of that. Though it, I mean, we did say, you know, try to let the robot system drive on its own, and if you find that they don't, then feel free to take over. So the instructions were a little bit loose, and so we don't know, but, but presumably these people who were, we were collecting this data from, um, D weren't doing it because they wanted to take over control. Yeah? Yeah. And so I should clarify, you're right, that the first part of the instruction is what we gave them essentially. Only take over control when you think it's necessary. For, it's because this data was collected for that experiment. But we, didn't give them the, we did not give them the second part where we said, you know, you can only get up to five seconds of control and then control will be taken away from you unless you hit that red button. Right, we, which we could have done and then it would have been a little bit less pleasant, but we would have been able to tease apart these kinds of things a little bit more cleanly. Yeah, um, it, it, and we, we may well d do that. Um, on the other hand, we also started thinking about a slightly different problem, which is the fact that you know social navigation doesn't always mean trying to avoid people, trying to stay away from people, trying to keep a good distance from people. Um, in some cases, in particular, because we are dealing with wheelchair robots, it's often the case that the person who is a wheelchair user is accompanied by someone, maybe another wheelchair user, maybe not. Um, and so we spend some time trying to think about what are the ways that we could build algorithms for people in wheelchair to move together in environments. Um, and that falls a little bit also, it was a little bit self-serving because we feel, well, if we can walk along a person, then we'll get really good at tracking people and following them. And then maybe we can use that new found capability within our social navigation to track people that we don't necessarily want to follow. So we took this little detour towards trying to do social navigation in the sense of following a person and accompanying them while you're moving around in a space. And when we started, we thought this should be kind of a solved problem. There's been like trackers around for, I don't know, back to the days of Kalman. Um, so, you know, we should be able to do that. And we started digging. We were willing to just pick some ROS package. It turned out not to be that easy to the point that we ended up collecting our own data sets, um, building our own package, um, and hopefully others don't have to go through that same hard work. So what I'm going to describe in the last little 20 minutes is the package that we've built for doing that. I should say it's a reasonably standard package, has three components. The first part is an autonomous module for detecting legs. This works with a laser rangefinder. We're mostly using the Hokoyu sensor, so we've run some of our experiments with the SICK laser rangefinders as well. 2D scan at about 30 centimeters off the ground. So our first job is to detect those things called legs from the laser feed. The second step is to actually take these objects that have been labeled legs and try to track them over time. And the third part is to actually 
do a closed loop control algorithm such that our robot can follow these things called leg as they're being tracked in the environment. And so each of these components is actually um, relatively straightforward. In terms of the leg detection, the first thing we do is take the scan information and do a clustering of the points and we pick out a few specific clusters and then we've trained uh, machine learning algorithms, in this case based on random forest classifier, that classifies these clusters based on geometric features of the cluster. So we don't take just the points themselves, we take the cluster and we look at the dimensions of the cluster in 2D. We look at how much spread there is, the variance and so on. We have a list of about 12 features for each of the clusters. From a given scan, we can have more than one cluster. So that operation is applied on a per scan basis. And we take all of our data we train our random class forest classifier so every time we get a scan we can actually make a prediction about which of these things are clusters or potentially legs and we can also get a confidence prediction of what's the probability of that thing actually being a leg cluster. So when we do that it looks something like this. We'll take the sound off so I can tell you. <coughs> we have the robot over here. I'm showing you with a stationary robot because it's a little bit cleaner. Um, we have multiple people. In this case, there was three people walking around. We've tested this up to 10 or 15 people in the environment. Um, the number of um, false positive and identity switches goes up when you have more people. But it's relatively reliable. And what we see is as we're doing the classification of whether it's a person or not, we add a little bit of color. So at first, all the tracks are just little black dots, just means that's the output of the clustering step. So we've identified these things as being potential leg clusters. So you see a lot of them in the background as well, but you see a few of them in pairs. And after the classification step, mostly the ones that are moving around are being labeled as legs, whereas the one in the back stay black. That means we don't really think that they're legs. In this case, we're not doing the tracking yet. On each frame, we're doing just the detection of the legs. So it's relatively reliable. It's also not using pairs of legs yet. It's just doing detection of individual legs at this particular stage. So if you're just doing detection at this stage, why after some length of time do they become blue? You would, you would, one would think that it's independent of the history and so in this case, the only reason they become blue is because in my video I wanted to show you the stage where we haven't run the detection yet just to show you what the, what the clustering outputs. And when they become blue, it's when we start doing the classification. So when you start, there's a point in the video where the blue starts to appear. In, in this case, here we're not doing the, it's just to show you the output of the clustering step. And as soon as you see some blue, then I'm showing you the output of the classification step. And it comes in in a few seconds. So here I'm showing you the output of the classification step, just to show you the difference. And this we've um, tried on two different robot platforms, both on the robot wheelchair, but we've also poured this on a Husky robot, for those of you who know the ClearPath Husky robot, with just the same kind of sensor. Um, and we've done experiments both indoors and outdoors. So the robots, the results I'm showing you here are for the indoor case with the wheelchair, but the Husky we took outdoors with the same Hokoyu sensor, which isn't quite rated, I guess, for outdoor usage, but seems to do relatively well. We didn't tweak a single parameter of the classification or anything like that. It seems to be very robust. It was all trained with the indoor data in a lab. It wasn't trained outdoor at all. Um, in terms of autonomous tracking, we are not really trying to, you know, do shatteringly new things. In this case, we're using a Kalman filter with fixed hand-coded parameters. Um, and we are then using uh, data association to figure out how to match points from one, one frame to the other. That works relatively well. And at this point, we initialize the idea that you want to track pairs of clusters, not necessarily individual clusters. So there's a notion of persistence. If you see the same clusters over time, it gets tracked by the common filter. And when you see two of them over time that are being tracked, then you can identify that as a human. And what we see is happening over here. We've gone from the stage where we've detected these <laughs> individuals. And at some point you're going to see them grow into people. That means that we've actually tracked them and that we're able to identify the pair of them as an individual. What you're seeing here is the uncertainty area from the common filter. 
That's projected onto here to give you a sense of what we're doing. And so again, in this case, at the point where you start seeing the people is when I've, init I've started that part of the algorithm. And so you start to have a little bit more form in terms of how these things are moving around. You can have multiple of them in the environment. Um, in this case, <coughs> um, so something else that may be useful is that the robot isn't moving, so we're not really dealing with the fact that the background subtraction needs to happen. We've done some experiment with that. I'll show you some results a little bit later. But in this case, it tends to be that when we have many people that we're tracking in the environment, um, it's still quite a bit noisy when the robot is moving along. So I'm not confident that this type of, um, that this approach that we are doing solves yet the problem of having a moving robot in a crowd independently tracking all the individuals in that crowd. Um, I think we still have some work to do for that, but in the case where your robot is stationary and you have quite a few people, things are relatively good. Um, in terms of the autonomous following, we're really doing something very simple at this stage. We're doing a closed loop control directly on the velocities of the individual, just trying to match the velocities to follow the person around as they're moving through. And so if I show you a little bit what that looks like, this is the view from the Husky that we've trained. In this case, it's walking in a field that's like the Canadian Space Agency um, over the summer. Um, in some cases, we tried to confuse the robot against some people walking in front, um, but most of the case, the person was just walking in front of it, and we've used this for a teach and repeat kind of task. Uh, we've used it for a few other <coughs> cases where we wanted to do mapping of very, very large scale environments. So I'm showing you in this case a very short clip. We have a longer clip, some of you are interested. And in this case, we followed the person for 100 meters. I think it was about a... F uh, we had an 800 meter loop at the end of the day where it was able to follow the robot and there was sort of three instances where the robot veered off a little bit and lost track of the person. And in all the case, all the person has to do is kind of walk back into the field of view and the robot picks it up again because the detection is acting frame by frame. So it's actually the reinitialization, finding the person again is very, very easy in this case. Um, it's quite natural, it's almost like a little dog following the person around. Um, and again, this is a person tracker that was really only trained in the lab on indoor lighting conditions. This is a laser, so that's the advantage of not dealing with camera data for this kind of thing. Um, that worked, you know, day one we put it on the Husky and within 45 minutes it was tracking, detecting, following the person quite easily. And um, we have quite a few now data sets from all of this, so if some of you are interested in this we can share the data, we're happy to do that. Uh, we look at a few formal statistics, lots of different things um, in terms of what could be done for this. Uh, maybe a few things to draw your attention to. In our cases, in particular because we're concerned with following people, one of the things that we're really interested in is um, trying to figure out if there's any cases where we have identity switches. So trying to avoid taking a person for another person. Uh, so we looked at some of the different approaches that were available. One of the interesting questions that we had is, should we be tracking legs individually? Does it matter that at some point we impose the constraint that we want pairs of legs? So if you look at the joint leg versus the individual leg, what we were really interested in is figuring out what's the importance of imposing that constraint on the pair of legs because we all know that if you end up being sideways to your sensor, you're going to miss out one of the legs. It turns out as the person is moving, you don't miss them for enough frames that this is really a concern. And so there's really robustness that comes out of trying to match the pairs of the legs that turned out to be quite important in terms of the performance for limiting the number of identity switches. In particular, if we look at the following indoor data set, the number of identity switches that we had went down drastically when we looked at pairs of legs rather than individual legs. Um, and the leg detector is just sort of the previous state of the art, the one package that we could find to try to run on our robot. Um, <coughs> didn't perform quite so well in this case. And most of this is running in real time. Most of the case, the average running time is about 25 frames per second, which is what we needed to do. There's a few cases I'm showing you sort of the worst run time where we're a bit below real time, though not far off, still within sort of less than an order of magnitude. So it seems to be going relatively well. One of the things that we're very, in two of the things we're interested in doing, I should say. Um, one of them more on the clinical side and one of them more on the technical side. Um, we have had many requests on the clinical side 
from partners at McGill University and beyond in Montreal for using this uh, this ability to track people in real time in flexible spaces for clinical purposes. And so right now we're trying to build a program for doing localization, precise localization of a person in an environment. Um, in our case, we're trying to do gait analysis of people who've suffered a stroke. And so the idea is that if you can analyze precisely their gait patterns, you can get reliable information both about their particular current condition, as well about their training program. So as you're doing rehabilitation with them, how are they improving? That's going to manifest itself in their gait. Um, and as well, use that information for diagnostic purposes in terms of what kind of training program should we be giving them. That depends on what you can observe. Uh, and so we have started using our person tracker that we've developed for doing that. Um, both from a stationary position, just kind of position the laser at one part of the environment and walk, let the person walk through. Um, they're doing that right now with a full mocap system, um, which is hard to deploy in natural settings. So they're interested in seeing how does the person move around, for example, in their home environment, as opposed to only in the lab in the mocap system. That's a really different analysis. So in this case, we can walk in with our laser rangefinder, plop it down on their kitchen floor, and do the gate analysis there in real time. Um, we're interested in comparing that with a few other alternatives, maybe with camera systems, Wi-Fi triangulation, things like that. Maybe um, it's still not clear whether that's the most reliable position information that we can get, but uh, there's a lot of interest in trying to figure out how to do this. The other thing that we're really interested in doing is uh, on the technical side. As I mentioned, I think the tracking that we're using right now uses a very simple Kalman filter where we don't do any modeling of the motion pattern of the person. But there's some cases where the person that is walking with the robot, we may be able to build a dynamic model of how they're moving and our ability to use that model as part of our tracking could really improve the quality of what we're doing. Um, and so it's really too, prelim too preliminary to give much detail about today, but we've been looking at some of the spectral learning algorithm and figuring out how we can use these techniques to build dynamic models of the person. And one of the interesting challenges, I think, is try to get these spectral learning methods to work in real time. And so build dynamic models from relatively little data, not observe the person for hours of data and try to do training from that. That we kind of know how to do. But observe the person for short periods. If I get a 20 second clip of the robot moving around with the person, I start with my default velocity model. Can I build in real time some good dynamic models using spectral methods and maybe modify these model independently for the different individuals that I'm tracking. Um, so there's a program of research that's going on in that direction, but I don't have too much to report on that. Um, I think I'm going to wrap it up here. Um, there's obviously, as I mentioned, a team of fantastic people who are doing a lot of this work. Some of the grad students at McGill University, I talk, mostly talked about the work of Bun Joon Kim, who is responsible for all the work on imitation learning and inverse reinforcement learning. And then the work of Angus Lee, who is responsible for the work on people tracking. Thanks. Yes, Emma. I thought the social navigation stuff was really interesting. I wondered whether you'd be able to pose it also as a supervised learning problem, where the sort of objective is just go forward, and then you have some constraints over don't hit anybody, rather than posing it as sequential. I think in some cases we may be able to do that. Just you're saying because the, the sequences don't matter that much at the scale of trajectories that we're looking at. Yeah, so in fact, I mean, our planner right now that we're using is a myopic planner. It's just that the cost function that we're inferring is based on the trajectories from the expert. But in terms of the actual planning that we're using, I'm trying to remember, but I don't think we're doing forward lookups very deep. It may be greedier just a little bit further than that, but not much more than that. So the reverse question might be interesting is if we plan deeper, do we do any better? Um, and I think my impression is not a lot better. I think your intuition is right in that front. Yeah. I want to ask about the features that you used. Um, so did I misinterpret you that you're using 
um, average velocity and average direction of the crowd? We're using average over local bins. So we're binning the environment and we're doing local averages, sort of left and close, front and close, right and close. So we have this nine bins of the space in front of us. And over those bins, we're doing average, but not over the whole scene. So we get to do differential information, like on this side, people are moving in this direction, and on that side, people are moving in that direction. And, and those bins are relative to the robot as opposed to relative to the Always relative to the robot. Okay, so you don't actually, you wouldn't actually know, for instance, that, um, you know, that, that there's a there group of people going alongside the wall. Um, Not explicitly, no. No. That, that, I think, I, w I would think that taking that environmental information into account is probably a... Yeah, so, so it's a really interesting question of what richer features do we need to take into account. And I have a student who's starting to look at that using camera data in this case. Because in particular for the occlusion question, there's a sense that you know, the user on the wheelchair is seeing the person standing behind that's coming in because maybe they're higher up, because they have richer sensory perception. So there's certainly a sense that there's a lot more information there that we're not taking advantage of. If I have two people coming at the robot and one goes that way, one goes yeah. that way, the average direction is going to be straight at yeah. the robot. Yeah. Yeah, it could be that. Th there's a trade-off between the finer binning, you're going to get fewer points from your point clouds in the finer bins. So you have to pick out that, right? And we didn't do a lot of fine-tuning of that. <laughs> yeah, well, I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, something to look at. Yes, Sergeant. studies on actual humans and if you could compare notes. Yeah, so there's a lot of literature, for example, on what they call proxemics, which tell us person to person, how do we behave? You know, you and I are trying to get into an elevator at the same time. What are safe distances for us to keep? You know, if you get into the Tokyo Metro, maybe it's not quite the same as like getting into the seminar room here. Um, so. So there's a literature on that. Um, it tends to be a little bit prescriptive at the conceptual level and a little bit light in terms of, you know, tell me what are the weights that I need for my cost function and my planning algorithm. So it has some high level principles. Um, I have a student who's looked at whether he can cover the proxemics literature and extract all the features that they say matter and use the features drawn from that literature and then still use our kind of approach to put the weights on these features. Right now, all we pick these features based on our own intuition, but seeing if that literature has more to say about that. Um, question is still out on that, but they certainly worry about these things. Sid. Thank you for the great talk. Um, this is a follow up to uh, Matt's question. If someone else was uh, driving the wheelchair for you, um, would that freak you out as well? And I, I sort of think back to my own experiences, like when I, I'm sitting in the passenger seat when my wife is driving, it's probably experience. Uh, um, it's sometimes, even though she is producing motion that is, you know, very, very, according to her, somewhat logical and, uh, and predictable, um, it, it, I'm, I'm a little uncomfortable because it's not sort of expressive of what it wants to do. Yeah. And I wonder if the burden of the robot controller is more than just producing nominal motion, but actually producing motion that is um, sort of more intent expressive of what it wants to do. So, so, you know so, this talk is taped. <laughs> <laughs> it is taped, I can confirm. <laughs> but he's not mic'd. So I won't repeat the question. But um, so, so we have some really interesting discussions about that in the lab. So we ran a little experiment, which is the following. There was a person sitting on the chair, let's say that's you, and there is a person behind with the joystick control, let's say it's me for now. Um, and so I get to drive the robot around and in your hand you have a clicker and whenever you feel unsafe you click that clicker. And there's also two people in the environment, one that's in close interaction, one that's far away, and they, when they feel uncomfortable. So one of them is like mimicking like the person accompanying the wheelchair, and one of them is mimicking just some random bystander avoiding the wheelchair. So I'm the person behind the curtain and I get to move, and these three people are all clicking on their clicker. And we certainly notice very different patterns of who's uncomfortable when. Um, but we found that the, so, so, so our initial hypothesis was that there was a point of view effect. 
So depending what's your point of view on the situation, your cost function is different, right? That seems to make sense. Um, we don't have data that's strong enough, at least to publish on this, um, but what we find is that the even stronger correlation deals with the level of expertise of the person with respect to that robot. So whenever in any of these positions the actor is a person who's used to the wheelchair, knows how it's going to move, has a really strong motion, even though they don't know me as a controller, they are used to the system and they know that the system's not going to behave erratically, they're willing to get much more closer, they are very rarely uncomfortable, and when they're people who are not familiar with a the robot, their discomfort level goes up and they keep on clicking. So there seems to be a bigger effect of experience than of point of view, but we don't yet have enough data to be conclusive on this. But I think it's a really interesting question. Yes, Matt? When you said this and I missed it, I'm kind of curious about what it takes to, not, not to follow somebody, but walking alongside them. So then there's a symmetric thing going on. And, uh, there's this fun thing that happens where occasionally you make opposite decisions and run into each other. Or, yeah. And, you know, this person thinks we should be at it. I'm just curious. This one decides to turn and the other one doesn't quite know. And Yeah. And um, what do you think about that? We haven't done it yet. That's definitely on our very short-term to-do list. We want to follow from beside and also put the person behind. So, you know, the person is going, the robot is going forward, but they want to make sure they don't lose the person. So in this case, it's just the tracking. We need some kind of simple behavior. We haven't done it. In our case, the, the uh, range of our sensor, the way it's placed, there's a little bit of a blind spot on both sides, and we're a little bit concerned that maybe we're going to lose the person because of that, and that's going to be problematic. So something that we should do. Um, our first pass is going to be to try to take what we've done and run it the same and not make any modification, um, except maybe on the controller in terms of how we do the control. Um, but there's kind of a leader follower question. If the person is in front, it's clear that they're leader. If the robot's in front, they're the leader. When they're side by side, this notion of leader follower is a little bit more subtle, and we haven't given much thought to how we're going to handle that. So at first we're just going to follow the person, see how it goes, and then we'll see. Yes? Yeah, you're allowed to follow up question. Do you have enough wheelchairs to put them in a circle? <laughs> <laughs> Can two points define a circle? <laughs> we have two right now in Montreal and there's a third that we're working, two more in, um, at UBC in Vancouver where we're working with their team quite consistently, sharing code, design for microcontrollers and things like that, but they're on different coasts and different time zone. Eventually we could put them together. What do you want to do once they're in a circle? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yes? So for your uh, social uh, navigation, it seems like for your inputs to the IRL, you weren't using any feedback which is uh, to state that uh, this thing is explicitly a human or not. No, yeah, none of that. Uh, do you try to uh, think of uh, using any of the RGBD uh, human detectors as an input to that? Yes, so now we're starting to look at the camera data, picking out what's the right set of features from that camera data and so on. Um, the, the easier step is to just start using our leg tracker, the output of our leg tracker as part of our feature set, but I have a new student who's looking explicitly at what we can do with vision. Yeah. Yes? Do the size of those bins we're looking for velocity data, um, does that scale dynamically with, say, yeah. obstacles in the environment where if you're in that compressed hallway, it becomes smaller to allow them to get around closer proximity versus a large room? Yeah. We haven't done that. Theoretically, we could. I, I should say, actually, that the type of features that we used, we actually took them because they had already been used in some of the literature, some of the work that Dieter Fox and his team did use the same feature vector representation. And so that's where we started. I think you could do a lot of that dynamic adjustment, but then it tends to be more parameters that you have to learn in your learning system. So it reaches a little bit in this question of you know, looking at richer sensor information that's the kind of thing that we could fit into that because having the, the uh, in a sense having a smaller resolution bin but where you can you know put them together and not constrain them to have similar values or not uh, say that louder cartesian it's a cartesian or polar ah sorry cartesian or polar right now they're cartesian 
Yeah. Yes. Now the policy that we're learning uh, assumes that everybody is just you know, regular people just walking out of the streets. Mm -hmm. And I assume that it's like dogs, it's another wheelchair that's coming across, then you'll need a different policy, right? In a sense, because we have such naive features, it doesn't matter so much because we're just. The same, like, uh, the same wheelchair that like, sold up. Like, one of them is the wheelchair and the bus. Yeah, but in a sense, we're just looking at the density of points in the environment and their direction of movement. That's really very naive information. So I think it would do fine with other types of objects, whether it be other robots or other wheelchairs or dogs or things like that. As long as we pick them out of the sensor information, I think compared to something that, like our leg detector, I think our leg detector would be very poor if we have a, you know, a control algorithm that's built on that rich information. So that's a bit the advantage of using the naive features. I mean, when you see a wheelchair coming across you, But so what, what behavior do you want other than avoiding it in this case? Mm -hmm. What behavior do you want to observe? It's just like if you just drive your you know, wheelchair straight yeah. through the crowd. We, which is definitely not what we're doing here. Yes, exactly. We're going... It, it will still be fine probably because the others will adopt. <laughs> yeah, I don't think we can... Uh, I, 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 I'm not sure we'll get ethical approval to run that experiment. <laughs> <laughs> so on that note, thanks for your My pleasure. <laughs>